Welcome to Concussion Talk Podcast. I'm Nick Mercer. This is my first podcast since August, and I'd just like to thank everyone for listening and for listening to my Bug Chipper Cross Canada podcast I did this past summer. This is episode 30 of Concussion Talk Podcast, and I'll be talking to Alan Champagne. Alan is a PhD candidate at Queen's University. He is studying sports related concussion using neuroimaging and looking at sports specific biomechanics. Here is Alan to discuss his research. Yeah, I'm talking to Alan Champagne now and I will get him now to introduce himself and describe more fully his research. So Alan, please. Yeah, uh, so thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Alan Champagne. I'm an MD, PhD student here at Queen's University uh, under Dr. DJ Cook, who's a neurosurgeon for um, the university. And uh, so I work with the Center for Neuroscience Studies, which is uh, a multidisciplinary program at Queen's uh, to look at, you know, investigate the brain and, and from different aspects. So our research specifically is really focused on uh, t- integrating and you know, c- cutting edge neuroimaging practices. So, using the MRI to uh, model the brain physiology after head trauma. So, head trauma could be uh, after a sport related concussion, which is obviously a big topic of interest now in athletes, um, but also the effects of uh, repetitive uh, subconcussive trauma, which are impacts to the head that don't really cause any symptoms and or kind of go under the radar. Um, and so if you think about football players or any contact sports, uh, they, they, they receive a lot of impacts. And so what we're trying to figure out is, number one, um, does the brain change or fluctuate after these impacts? So um, using different methods, you know, looking at blood flow, uh, cerebral activity, um, and other brain metrics that we can use to investigate whether or not the brain can fluctuate. And so question one is, what is the, what is the effects of these impacts on the brain? Number two, uh, what, what we're trying to leverage here is our expertise in sports and technology to uh, integrate different ways to actually measure that those impacts. So, well, one would be the biomechanics of these impacts. So we have um, helmet accelerometers in the helmets of all the, of the fo- football players here at Queens. And so we, we investigate basically uh, the exposure of these players. So like how they get hit. So from a bio- biomechanical standpoint, and so how often they get hit and where um, and the third part is we use video analysis to actually then uh, watch these players play in the game. Uh, so so I'm, I'm also a coach for the football, for the football team as well here. So I get to manage these guys on the field um, and use that knowledge to, you know, to change coaching practices. And so it's really a multimodal approach where we use the imaging to inform us about the effects of these impacts and then use different technological events like the accelerometers or different film analyses to um, then change the behavior on the field. Um, and now we're expanding that to different high school as well. So. Oh, great. So uh, do you, do you only, do you restrict this to just football? No, do we have, I got, no, we, we, so right now we have a project with a bunch of high school teams uh, for football teams, and we're hoping to expand this into hockey as well. Um, like this year, we we're, what we're waiting for is really a team to commit to uh, our research. And so, uh, usually that's the the number one step. Okay, cool. So, uh, so you mentioned you study biomechanics and how that impacts the uh, well, impacts sort of part of the pond there, but uh, affects the affects your affects the because of hits or the because mm-hmm. of hits that matter. Um, so what what about my biomechanics? Are they are sports specific biomechanics or are they just general? Ideas? No, they are. So so the way we so there's like two ways that we like to think about the biomechanics so one is the 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 true uh the metrics so if you look at the linear and rotational uh parameters of an impact and so that's what the accelerators are for right they're in the helmets and they can quantify the really deep metrics uh to characterize each impact so what was it what were the linear components what were the rotational components what was the location the force uh, and etc um and then i think there's also uh a more qualitative stand where you can look at the reason for the impact, so the player's technique. Um, and so I, I'm i a big believer that the, the risk of each individual is, is really deep grained into the player's you know behaviors on the field, so the way they play and their style of play. 
uh, and whether that's, that can be changed based on different coaching practices um, and or proper education to the player about their, their metrics, uh, their technique. Um, but we, and that's what we're kind of looking to it now, like how can we, one, assess the players, figure out what's bad about their technique and what's their risk, um, and then use that to actually inform our coaching practices. So it's really taking an evidence ba- evidence based way to um, cater coaches coaching practices and um, and just like you know teaching uh, in a new way that's using the science and the evidence behind it. Well, great. Last year, I'll answer my question about what do you hope this research will show, but um, well, it's uh, showing already. Like we, yeah. we see a lot of we see a lot of great. Uh, well, we get one we get a lot of great feedback from the players because they, they you know they can appreciate the idea of using the science to you know better their game. Yeah. Um, but we also find uh, that there are fluctuations in the brain that may not be necessarily related to head impacts directly, um, but that uh, fluctuate you know, to some metrics fluctuate over the season. And so now what we're trying to figure out is um, are there players that are more susceptible to that or not. And is there ways for us to actually mitigate that? So if we change the player's behavior, can we actually uh, limit those effects? Um, so you, and you're actually a, you're a good one to teach them about biomechanics because you played football, right, for in yeah. the States? For yeah, years. so I played, uh, I played for the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, so the Tar Heels. Yeah. Um, played a bit of fullback, a little D-line, and then some, some teams there. And so that's one of the things that we – I, our team really wants to focus on is using our expertise um, in the sport, yeah. and so to really leverage the research. And so it's it's quite difficult to go to um, do something if you don't really have an authority uh, with them. And so it's it's great to have that relationship with the, with the guys because they can appreciate where I come from, where I come from, and that uh, our research and our lab isn't there to really hurt the sport, but instead to really enhance the sport. Yeah. And so it's 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 definitely a good a good mix of the two. Uh, a little bit of science expertise and a little bit of football expertise together uh, makes this project possible. So have you been in contact with uh, like the hockey coaches or the or phys ed department about about them helping out with their with your studies for say hockey or rugby? Yeah, so we we've been in touch with a few teams um, and departments around Kingston. And then now that we have another project going on called the Neuroprotection Project, and so it's it's available online. It's it's easy accessible. But the, what what this project is about is is ba- is we've defined a new baseline. So for, for football teams, and the baseline incorporates both the performance aspect and also a sport specific uh, drills so that involve some tackling and some blocking. And what we do is we actually film every kid using uh, cameras. From different angles, okay. and then we we score them, and so we we then educate the, the kids and the, the coaches and the trainers about the technique that they need to work on, and so this is really attractive for for high schools with, with the Rowan's Law just coming in. Um, that's that requires some injury prevention um, initiative to be taken, and so what we're trying to do with this project is really set the gold standard for that uh, in terms of injury prevention uh, for football right now as a, as an as a as a as a sample. And then now that this has been done and, and is working quite great, um, we've now getting we're not getting interest from, from hockey teams and, and rugby teams because right. it's the same idea, right? You you assess the mechanism of injury that are related to concussion or to more you know to head trauma, and then you find ways to actually change that and improve that on the field or on the court or on the ice. And so um, the the fundamental idea is that we can use science, we can use data to tell us. You know where the risk is for each player, um, because the risk is, is to me is really at the individual level. It's not, you know, of course there's, there's team risk and there's risk involved with the environment. You know, like yeah. depending on what what kind of you play on turf, you play on grass, you play on ice. But in the end, to me, what the, the main risk is is really to the, the individual. And so it's my job as a coach to find that risk, or as a scientist, it's my job to find that risk and to educate the coach about how to uh, better. Or, target and enhance his coaching practices to make his players better but also safer players okay so you're back to biomechanics now you said that you so you want to assess the risk so do you concentrate only on in back like tackles or well, i guess tackles so, so or do you look at how they're falling or 
or like what, yeah. I'll be there or something like that like yeah so so we so one of our projects that I have uh, one of my students work on is looking at game film okay. and we look at game film and we look at different ways to um, you know figure out why guys get hit and how can we actually change that okay. um, and so really what it comes down to is there's a few papers on on mechanism of injury looking at like for every sport here are the things that are more you know here are where guys get hit more often or here are where guys get or girls get injured more often and so once we know that we know that th- these th- this is kind of where the risks stand and then we can actually you know test that we can assess that on our players and say how do our players do in this situation and the players that don't do well may be at higher risk and if that's the case, then we can change that using um, some behavior modification technique. And, and again, the, the big idea behind the behavior modification was uh, comes from uh, Dr. Kevin Guskwicks and Eric Schwartz. Um, so Guskwicks is at UNC, where I did my undergrad, and so I trained under him for quite a while. And then Eric Schwartz is at the University of New Hampshire. And so they've started this idea about a few years ago, and we we're trying to bring this to Canada and really help us uh, help, use that to help us make the game safer. Oh. Um, without taking away the integrity of, of what the game's about, right? So the physicality, the competitiveness, the brotherhood. Um, so we, I, you know, there, 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 there are a lot of really good things about sports. Um, yeah, and and with head injuries right now, there's a lot of you know debates around whether or not we should let, you know keep going with these sports. And so what we're hoping to really provide the field and the literature and and parents and anybody out there is is a solution. Um, yeah. So not to cancel the sports, but to make it safer uh, using the the science behind it. Speaking of the science behind it, uh, the neuroimaging. So, what do you look for in your neuroimaging in your just MRIs, or is it like what what, no. what are these, like flows of blood or flows of? Yeah, yeah. You know? So there's a few few gadgets that we have. Um, so the MRI obviously is, is one big scanner. Uh, it's a it's a three T Tesla. It's and and it, we have it at Queens with, with the CNS, which is great because we have access to the we have a great research facility here. And so what we hope what we look for with the MRI is, is a few different things. Um, you can look at uh, integrity of the white matter, and so there's different white matter tracks that um, have shown to be susceptible to head impacts. And so we look at that integrity. Then we can look at the connectivity between those tracks, so how well you know how well do different regions of the brain can can not really speak to each other, but really like function together um, using some. Is that, dip- is that is that a, is that dark matter? Pardon? Is that the dark matter that does that? No, the, the great the gray matter. The gray yeah. matter, sorry. Yeah, the gray matter. I'm watching brain, TV the, the functional part of your brain, and then the white matter would really be the track that connects. Right, them. right. And so you can look at the integrity of the track. You can look at the gray matter functionality. We can also look at the vascular response so the vascular physiology in the brain is highly um, guiding towards like the metabolism and your resting you know oxygen demands and so your brain will adapt or react in different ways um to maintain that homo- homeostasis right so what we're looking we look for things like blood flow and um other metrics that we that we believe uh, may underlie the uh, symptomatic response to the injury. And so we think that if, if these metrics are disturbed, uh, there may be a cascade of other events that could relate to the symptomatic response after a concussion and or even you know the asymptomatic response and the, the slow buildup of trauma that may accumulate over time. So we use these metrics to really understand if that is, you know, that one, if that's the case, um, two, if there's regions that are more susceptible. So are there region-specific um, susceptibility across the brain that we can you know, kind of pick up and understand? And then is there a relationship between that and the biomechanics? And so if, you know, all, in the end, like we can't really look at things in, 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 in islands, right? It's, it's a one big model. There's movements involved. There's, you know, there should be some MRI involved. There should be some biomechanics involved. And, and all together, they tell you the real problem. And or the real solution. So there's two ways to see it. Um, and so we're really, try- we're really trying to bring in all these different, no- all these different knowledge to educate us and inform us about what is really going on, and then how can we fix it? Well, okay. I was going to ask you about it. why, how you measure it and stuff, but you've described the videotapes and the accelerometers. But uh, so what are you, what are you doing up at this? I mean, now it's you've been up for a few hours. You said, and it's, it's only. 
it's only seven thirty or seven quarter eight here, and so and there's so there's like what six quarter, six sixteen here. Six yeah. There you go, yeah. and you've been on for two hours already. So yeah, well, I mean, well, we we have a few we have a few projects going on uh, right now. So obviously, fall is always a busy time of the year um, with coaching here at Queens, and then working with the project. And so we've taken on uh, the whole school board here in Kingston. Oh, uh, nice. So the whole school board, uh, which is just Limestone District School Board in Kingston, yeah. has taken initiatives to uh, really set the standard with the Rones Law. And so they've committed all their junior football teams uh, to the Neuro Protection Project where we oh, sorry, use the want, cameras do, to... Do you want pardon? to mention what Rowan's Law is? Yeah, so mention? Rowan's Law was a law that was passed by the Ontario government uh, just recently, I would say that within the last two months, following uh, an incident that happened three years ago in rugby. And so the the law, which is coming in um, this year, has a, a few a few objectives, one being education. And so educated, you know, we, we want to educate teachers, trainers, uh, athletes, pretty much everybody that's involved in sports about, you know, what are their concussions? How do they happen? What are the symptoms? What are the proper mechanism for return to play, return to learn? Um, and so it's really about increasing awareness of the injury uh, and as, a, as a community, which is great. And so we have a program called CESAP, uh, which stands for the Concussion Education Safety and Awareness Program. And that program really caters to that education. So Fee, uh, you know, really filling that gap in, in, that we have here in Kingston, and really educating everybody about uh, and increasing awareness about head, head injuries. The second part of the law is an injury prevention initiative. So they they are trying to define a code of conduct, and the code of conduct is supposed to be uh, some recommendation to teams and sport organizations about how to reduce injury. And oh. so that's not very clear in the law. I don't know. They, we we know where to go with this yet. We just want to set the initiative out there, and so because we knew the law was coming, uh, our team really you know designed this project, the neuroprotecting project, to cater to that demand, and so really fill the 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 demand here and say, we think we have a pretty good idea on how to uh, redesign sport specific baselines. So baselines again that involve uh, te- you know assessments that can target mechanism of injury so for football it would be tackling and blocking yeah. and then you know evaluate that and then use that to make sure that teams are are, are are safe and using safe practices and so because of that um i guess that timing the school board here really uh took that on and and, and is trying to set the goal standard which is awesome and so anyway the point is that we have all these athletes that we tested last week so we have about 400 athletes that we tested in the last week um, and now they, they have to, all have to be scored and all that. So on top of that, and then the work with Queens and then, you know, the other projects that we have going on, it's just, it's just not enough hours in the day. So yeah, exactly. four hours, nobody, no, no, everybody's sleeping. Nobody's, nobody's bothering me so I can get my work yeah. done. Perfect. So yeah. actually, la- last question. Do you, find any diff- do you find any difference between your high school students, your football, football players and their, and the Queens are older? That yeah, so we, yeah, so, so we've tested – We've, we've tested athletes between, I think, 11, all the way from about nine-year-old wow. all the way to about 25, uh, so you college players. Yeah. And so we have a quite a wide range of uh, understanding for the technique. And the idea with this is really to understand how a, like, how the development works. Right. Yeah. So is there an age that's either more susceptible and or is there an age where the learning curve actually becomes Take exponential? Time. Right. Exactly. So we want to know. I want to know or understand. And then, and then is there a position that actually matters? So if you look at factors like position, age, where they come from, like do they play in Quebec? Do they play in Ontario? Do they play? Right, which program or school board they play for? Is there a team that's, you know, like there are some coaches are are better than others. And that's the yeah. bottom line. Yeah. And some coaches have priorities uh, yeah. on safety. And so we were trying to understand now, like, is there a regional? differences across the oh. school board oh. uh, and then across Quebec as opposed to Ontario. And then there's so, so all these different things that we try to, you know, basically who's the safest and why. Right. Um, and so, yes, we do definitely, definitely see changes across age groups, but that's not, you know, that's expected. Yeah. Cause you would think that as you play, you get better. The yeah. better question is more like at this age group, what is the norm? Okay. And so once you know what the norm is for you know a specific age group or a specific position at that age group, you can then say how far are you from the norm, right. and then you know help players either get better, and or 
you know, sur- you know, surpass the norm and you know, and become, you know, and then reset the norm standard, right? So right. Uh, it's quite interesting to see uh, th- this shift in the culture. We're really trying. You can see in Kingston now, like coaches are really, you know, they're really open to the idea of in- involving safety in their practice, and and they're really receptive to the project. And so it was great to see uh, this community-based effort to to make the game safer. Because in the end, it's a team effort. It won't just come from us. Yeah. And it won't just come from the coaches and it won't just come from the government, right? We all have to sit together at the same table and say, you know, from all the parties involved, uh, how can we actually move this game forward? That's, uh, that's, uh, that's awesome. So, uh, well, so thank you. This is definitely something I want to come if I can inter- talk to you again. That'd be great. Later, sure. in, the, later in the year or whatever. But uh, this yeah. is, yeah. So thank you so much for talking to us today. Um, is there any, any football practice today? Yeah, we have a practice today. I think at four thirty. So if you're in Kingston and you want to come around, um, just come. Not near Kingston, but uh, <laughs> but yeah. But anybody is in Kingston for four thirty. Four thirty. I think it's it should be it should be good. Um, yeah. But the weather's okay there, Tay. For it. Hope so. You're hopefully. practicing everything, don't you? So. Yeah, we'll be there anyway, doing some science. So yeah. whether it's cold or hot or raining or snowing, yeah. there'll there'll be science going on. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you so much, Alan. Awesome, thank you. Thank you again to Alan Champagne for a great interview and I think a great discussion about his research. You can follow him on Twitter at the FB Scientist. Queen's University is my alma mater, and I hope this is the first among many discussions with those at Queen's who are interested in, interested in concussion. This is about the time I would normally say Go to my website, www.concussiontalk.com. But right now, my website is a bit wacky. It's a bit out of sync. But uh, please, you can listen to the to podcast. And hopefully, I'll see you again next episode. Thank you. As always, music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound. www.bensound.com. <laughs>